Doctor, do you consider this textbook to be authoritative? No, I don't. Doctor, do you consider this textbook to be authoritative? No, I don't. Doctor, do you consider this journal to be authoritative? No, I don't. Doctor, I'm going to read two statements from one of these textbooks and ask you whether you agree or disagree with this statement. Objection! The defense attorney yells out. What's the objection? You know that unless the doctor says that this textbook is authoritative, you know you can't ask that question. What are the other two types of questions that I can't ask that are going to get an immediate objection that tells the doctor, do not answer this question? Anybody know? This is interactive. Okay? There are two types. Come join me on this journey this morning as I share with you that information as well as other information you are going to know and going to need to know during the course of your legal careers. Hi everybody, I'm Jerry Oginski. I'm a New York medical malpractice and personal injury attorney. The answer to the question is questions that are privileged and questions that are palpably improper. So this occurs during the course of a deposition. What type of question would be palpably improper? Doctor, how many times do you beat your wife each night? What? That's a ridiculous question, right? It's got nothing to do with the claims in the case. It has nothing to do with the defenses in the case. So in that instance, the defense attorney would be well within his right to turn to his client and say, doctor, I direct you not to answer that question. The other instance where the defense attorney would be well within his right to tell his client not to answer the question during a deposition in a medical malpractice case is, doctor, before coming into court, before coming into this room to testify this morning, did you have a conversation with your attorney? Objection, that's privileged. Ah, actually it's not. The fact that the doctor had a conversation with the attorney is not privileged. What's contained within that conversation is, actually that's the follow-up question. Doctor, what did you and your attorney talk about? Objection, do not answer that question. So why do I share that with you? I share it with you just to give you a little bit of an insight into what goes on in a pretrial deposition in a medical malpractice case. So let's jump for a moment to Facebook and social media. Are any of your clients on social media? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. The defense sends a notice to me and says, hey, listen, Mr. Roginski, we want five years worth of your client's Facebook posts. And I say, what are you talking about? My client, I'm not giving you five years worth of Facebook posts. You should know, if you don't already, the defense will scour your client's social media posts forever. They'll go back to the beginning of time to find something that's contradictory to what they have said or what the claims are in this case. In a medical malpractice case, why would a defense firm want to learn information about what's on my client's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn? Because they're looking for contradictions. They're looking to see if there are any posts about activity levels what you can and can't do. Maybe you're rock climbing and you claim you can no longer rock climb. Maybe you claim you can no longer ski and here you are, pictures of you skiing. They want that information. Well, guess what? In years before, in the past, the courts have turned around and said, hey, you know what? Before you, the defense attorney, can ask for this information or gain access to this information, you have to show us that there's some contradiction. You have to show us that there's something there that gives you a hint or a suggestion that there's a contradiction. You can't just willy-nilly send out a request and expect five years worth of social media posts to show up on your doorstep. It doesn't work that way. Well, actually now it does because the law has changed. The defense no longer needs that prerequisite contradictory information or suggestion of it in order to obtain our client's social media posts. But now here's an interesting thing. They turn around and say, hey, give us five years worth or give us 10 years worth. Give us your entire client's account. And we say, you're out of your mind. You're not getting all that. And now it becomes a fight and a negotiation about how much time, what duration, my client's social media posts they can get access to. So I'll give you a great example. Last week I was in court in New York County and this exact issue came up. It was a wrongful death case of a young woman. And we claim that the, wrongful, the, the improper medical care happened for three months before her death. The defense attorney wanted five years worth of her social media posts on Facebook. We said, no, that's not happening. So they went ahead and made a motion. 
They said, Judge, we're entitled to this. I said, you might be entitled to some of it. I gave them a couple months worth. They said, no, we want more. So what happened? So now we go into court. I have opposition papers. The plaintiff, uh, the defense has, listen, we're entitled to get all this stuff. So while we're waiting for the case to be called, I turned to my opponent and I said, listen, what the hell are you doing asking for five years worth? There's nothing in there. And by the way, I already knew that there was nothing in there. So make sure you check your client's social media posts before you're able to say that. So I knew that there was nothing contradictory, but now I'm arguing over the point. And now he says, okay, so give us two years worth. I said, two years, what are you talking about? The wrongdoing happened only three months before she died. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a year's worth. And you know what, that was fine with him. So now our case finally gets called. The judge, as we're walking up to see the judge, she turns to us, and this is a really interesting point. You think every time you make a motion in court that the judge is so fascinated and interested with what you're asking for. Turns out they're not. And the judiciary in general does not want to get involved in how much of your client's social media posts they really have to you know, make an order over. So as, she, as we're approaching the bench, she says, counselors, do we really need to put this on the record or can we just step this out? The answer is, judge, we've already taken care of it. Thank you. The point is, in the past, your client's social media posts, they had to have a reason to ask for it. Now, you better make sure there's nothing in there. Oh, and one other thing. Under no circumstances should they be deleting anything. Because if they do that and the defense finds out about it, now you've got a problem. Now you're going to get into a whole bunch of hot water about what was in there, what was contained, and whether it's recoverable. So, why do I share this information with you? I share it with you because during the course of this morning's discussion, you're going to learn information that will help you understand how these cases work. And why is that important? Because during the course of your careers, you may not realize it now, you are going to encounter people who tell you tales of woe, who begin to tell you problems that they've had with a doctor or a hospital. You'll be on the soccer field with your kid, watching the game, talking to somebody. You'll be at Starbucks, getting something to eat, and now you strike up a conversation. And all of a sudden, somebody tells you, oh, let me tell you what happened. I was in the doctor, and I went in, and I had all these problems. The biggest mistake you are going to make is, tell me more. What happened? And now you are going to be stuck in that conversation for at least an hour without being able to extricate yourself. So at, towards the end of our discussion this morning, I'm going to give you four questions to ask that will short circuit this entire conversation and will give you an immediate sense of whether or not they may, may have a valid medical malpractice case. And it happens in, the, in less than a minute by asking these four questions. All right, so let's talk about this scenario. Your client secretly records their doctor in an office visit after a surgical procedure. The patient gets the doctor to admit, admit to the patient in a closed door setting, yes, you're right, I screwed up, I'm sorry. The patient has secretly recorded this information on his iPhone. He now wants to bring a lawsuit. He comes to you. You evaluate the case, it turns out there is a valid case, and you go forward. And you have this explosive piece of information. Can you withhold this information until the time of trial and use it to ambush the doctor in front of the jury? How many of you think you can withhold that information? How many of you think you can't? The answer is, if you intend on using this explosive information at the time of trial, you are required, required to disclose this information before, way before you ever get to trial. You know what would happen if we don't? We're at trial. I asked my client, hey, Mr. Jones, did you record the doctor during this conversation? Yes, I did. And did doctor know about it? No, he didn't. And do you have that video? Yes, let's see that video. The defense attorney, as if an ejection button is pressed, jumps up out of his seat, says, objection. Mr. Ojinski didn't disclose that to us. He didn't give that to us as he's required to do. The judge will turn to me and say, counselor, did you provide this to them before trial? Um, uh, no judge, we didn't. That's out and I can't use it. So if you intend on using that explosive information, give it to the defense as early as you can. And it has, one second, it has another purpose. The other purpose is that once they recognize they've got a problem, now it may actually initiate settlement negotiations 
and get them to realize that they have a significant problem for which there is no explanation. So don't hold that stuff back. If you've got something your client did, such as secretly record this information, make sure you turn it over to the defense. I'll get to the questions after, okay? All right, so how about the scenario? You, your client brings a lawsuit against his doctor, claiming that he was careless and that his carelessness was a cause of his injuries. The doctor, as a defense, turns around and says, why are you suing me? I did nothing wrong. And by the way, what I did was a judgment call. A judgment call based upon my expertise, based upon my experience, based upon my knowledge of this particular condition. I use my best medical judgment in order to render proper treatment to this patient. Don't blame me for something I use my best judgment on. Is that a good defense? The answer is, it's a damn good defense. You wanna know why? Because the doctor comes across as being very reasonable and saying, hey, look, I'm doing my best effort, using my best knowledge to go ahead and try and treat your client. And now, I'm sorry, but they did suffer a complication, but it's not my fault. How do we overcome this judgment, this judgment defense? It was a judgment call. Do you think we can do it? The answer is we can in certain instances. And by the way, juries love this defense. So it's very tough to overcome, but here's the scenario. Let's say a patient goes to five different doctors to get five opinions, four of whom say, hey, I would do the procedure this way. The fifth one says, no, 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 I'm gonna do it this way. The patient decides to go to doctor number five. Okay, what do you think happens? Patient has a complication and now turns around and sues doctor number five. And the doctor says, hey, this was a judgment call. I use my best judgment. The fact that the doctor was in the minority of what procedures to use, is that enough to hold them accountable and hold them liable? The answer is no, it's not. As long as that procedure that he chose was within acceptable medical standards, even though he was in the minority and not everybody would do it, it's still appropriate. However, if it turns out that the judgment that the doctor used in order to do this procedure fell below the standard of care, now that's where we get the doctor. And I'll tell you how, give you a great example. And I call this five minutes of a urology, five minutes of a urology procedure that destroyed this man's life. Here's the scenario. Young gentleman, 37 years old, was having difficulty urinating, goes to a urologist. It turns out the gentleman had scar tissue in the tube that takes the urine from the bladder out through the penis called the urethra. So the doctor did a procedure to actually cut open the scar tissue and it's called a cold knife urethrotomy. And it sounds as painful as it is. There's no anesthesia used during this. Um, but you know what, it worked. The procedure worked, but it's a Band-Aid procedure because the problem comes back. So a few weeks later, the patient was back in the office with the same problem. And the doctor says, yes, you've got scar tissue again. Let's open it up. And he does it again in the office. So now again, it works. But a couple of weeks later, what do you think happens? It comes back again. The doctor turns around and says, okay, I've got a better solution, a long-term solution. Let's take you to the operating room. We'll put you under anesthesia. I'm gonna put in a device called a stent a mesh metal stent into the tube, that urethra, to keep it open. And this is designed to be permanent so that the skin tissue called epithelial cells overgrow it and now it becomes embedded and now it stays open. He's like, yes, yes, let's do it. So he has the procedure done. Shortly after, literally before he gets home that day, he develops horrible, horrible pain. And by the way, the actual procedure worked, but now the patient is leaking urine. It works so well. What happened next? Every morning when the patient would get up to go to the bathroom and he'd have an erection, he would have the most excruciating pain he'd ever had in his life. Horrible, off the charts. If it was, you're, you're talking about pain on a scale of zero to 10, this is a hundred. He'd go back to the doctor and say, doctor, this pain is so horrible. I, I really am contemplating suicide. And the doctor wrote that in his notes, not just once, but twice. And finally, after a couple of weeks, the doctor says, you know what? Let's go back into the operator, operating room. Let's see if I can move that device, the stent, away. Maybe it's touching a nerve. Maybe it's too far back. Let's try that. The patient says, okay, please do something because this is horrible. So what happens next? So he does the procedure. 
during the procedure, remember when I said this is supposed to be embedded in his urethra? It's not supposed to be moved or manipulated because the skin overgrows it. The doctor is trying to grab hold of it and pull. Well, because it's not movable, he now starts tugging and pulling and pulling. This mesh metal device now starts shredding. And once he starts, he can't stop. And it's shredding. And by the time he's done, it had destroyed his entire urethra. This gentleman needed a year and a half worth of urological reconstructive surgery. And the doctor he went to to have this done told him in 30 years of practicing medicine, he has never seen something so horrible. It looks like a bomb went off in there. He's like, who did this to you? He sues his doctor. The doctor says, don't blame me. This was a judgment call. I use my judgment to decide this procedure was right for this patient. And you know what? That's not a bad defense. But there was a problem. This doctor failed to recognize that this procedure that he chose was not intended for young men. It was only intended to be used for gentlemen 65 and older who no longer had the ability to maintain an erection. Why? Because the studies had confirmed that patients who were younger, who still had that ability to maintain an erection, would get excruciating, horrible pain. The doctor failed to know this. He failed to recognize this. And so he chose a procedure that departed and deviated from the standard of care. And that's how we were able to hold him accountable in that situation. So that's why a judgment call may not be the ideal defense when they turn around and say, don't blame me. I did nothing wrong. So what are some other defenses that we see in these cases that you need to know about? So your client thinks something was done wrong. So the doctor, remember, first says, hey, why are you suing me? I did nothing wrong. That's defense number one. Then he turns around and says, hey, you, Mr. Patient, you did something wrong too. That's culpable conduct. He turns it on the patient and says, don't blame me. You're the one who screwed up. You caused your own problems. Then he says, hey, if I did something wrong, whatever I did didn't cause or contribute to your injuries. No causation. And number three, number four, they say, if I did something wrong, and you did something wrong, and I caused you harm, guess what? Your injuries are not as bad as you claim them to be. So now they're trying to minimize damages. Those are the key defenses that we see in these medical malpractice cases. All right. I have an interesting question for you. How can I get a doctor in a medical malpractice case to admit in his own words that he screwed up and was careless? Voluntarily. Anybody know? During the course of a lawsuit in a medical malpractice case, how can I get the defendant doctor to actually admit that he screwed up and do it voluntarily? The answer is using hypothetical questions at a deposition. So here we are. We're now in the middle of a lawsuit. We're now in the middle of discovery. I now have an opportunity to question the doctor whom your client has sued. All right. So how is it that I'm able to ask hypothetical questions? I'll tell you why. I can ask a hypothetical question because, first of all, the doctor is deemed to be a medical expert. Even if he's not, he's as a doctor who's being sued, the law considers him to be an expert, which means I can ask him leading questions during a deposition. I don't have to ask him open-ended questions. Doctor, tell us who, what, why, when, where. I can now ask leading questions. Now, I'm also able to ask the doctor to assume certain facts to be true. Doctor, I want you to assume that Mrs. Jones presented to your office on January 1st with the following complaints of A, B, and C. Would you agree that in that instance, good medical practice requires that you do X, Y, and Z? He has to say yes, because that is good medical practice. And I'm just using this as an example. Now, I flip the question around. Would you agree that a doctor who fails to do X, Y, and Z in that scenario, that would be a departure from good and accepted medical care? And the doctors never, ever want to answer that question. They always turn to their attorney and say, do I have to answer that? And the answer is yes, they have to answer that question. Why? Because it's not one of the three things I asked you at the very beginning. What are the three things that the doctor does not have to answer? Privilege, palpably improper, and things that he doesn't recognize to be authoritative. But in this instance, it's a hypothetical question. So why am I asking him questions? To, why am I asking him to assume these facts? 
I'll tell you why. Because the facts in a medical malpractice case are always disputed. My client says she made the following complaints of a breast lump. The doctor says, no, she didn't. We claim that the doctor did something improper. He says, no, I didn't. They're always factual disputes. You should know that a trial in a malpractice case involves credibility. The jury is going to evaluate whether our client, the plaintiff, is slightly more likely right than wrong that what we are claiming is true. It's all about credibility. So now I'm going to ask the doctor, assuming that our version of the facts are true, would you agree that in that instance it would be inappropriate to do X, Y, and Z? And the doctor ultimately has to say yes. And if the question is phrased properly, he has to say yes. Doctor, would you agree it's good medical practice to take detailed, thorough uh, notes for a history? Yes, I would. So maybe there's a claim that the doctor didn't take a thorough history. And now, doctor, would you agree that failing to take a detailed and thorough and accurate history would be a departure from good and accepted practice? Yes, I would. Terrific. So now I'm going to ask him a whole series of hypothetical questions, all favorable to us. Why? Because we are now using our version of the facts. So why is that important? It's important because now, as we get to trial, we're at trial. What is the jury evaluating? Which version of the facts they believe? Which one? Do they believe the doctor's version? Or do they believe our client's version? If the jury believes my client's version, guess what? The doctor has already testified and admitted that failing to do those things based upon the facts that we had are a departure from good and accepted practice. Think about that. Think about how powerful a tool this is to be able to get a doctor to admit in his own words that yes, if those things were or were not done, that would be a violation from the standard of care. So it's amazing if the jury believes our version of the facts. Now, you should know something interesting. This tool, this device of hypothetical questions, is not limited just to plaintiffs. The defense has the opportunity to do the same exact thing. And they will often do that at trial, not so much during a deposition of the plaintiff. Okay? But they will ask their doctor questions of facts that are favorable to the defense and using their version. So now the jury will then be evaluating both hypothetical sets of facts. And again, it comes down to who they believe. Does the jury believe our client? We don't have to show that we are 100% true or the jury doesn't have to show, you know, make absolutely certain that what we're claiming is true. Only slightly more likely right than wrong is the standard. So that's how we get that doctor to do that. All right, let's talk about time limits in which to bring a lawsuit because that is one of the most important things you as an attorney are going to have to decide when talking to somebody that you meet for the very first time, somebody who now tells you their story. And they, you have to decide whether or not this possible case is timely. Anybody here knows generally what the time limit is for medical malpractice cases for an adult, for a private hospital or private doctor? Anybody? Don't shout it out all at once. <laughs> the answer is an injured an adult has two and a half years from the date of any wrongdoing within which to bring a lawsuit against a private doctor or a private hospital. But there are many variations and exceptions, and I'm going to go through them with you because it's really important to know. All right. Now, let's say a woman goes to her doctor complaining of a breast lump. Doctor says, yeah, I see the lump. We're going to watch it. Come back in six months. We'll watch it. OK. Patient comes back in six months. It's no different. He says, come back again another six months. We'll continue to watch it. Well, the lump goes away. The doctor forgets about it. The patient forgets about it. And now the patient continues to go for a yearly checkup to the gynecologist. And now after four years, all of a sudden this lump returns. But now it's come back with a vengeance. It's big. It's angry. It's red. The doctor sees it and says, oh my god, we've got to get you to a breast surgeon for a biopsy. We're going to do a mammogram. We're going to do a sonogram. And lo and behold, after biopsy, turns out this is metastatic breast cancer. The same exact location where the patient had complained four years earlier. And now the patient wants to turn around and sue the doctor. Are they timely? Is this patient timely? Remember, I just told you, you normally have two and a half years from the date of the wrongdoing in which to bring a lawsuit. Under that rule, the patient's not timely, right? But there is a new law, a new rule in New York focused only on failure to diagnose cancer cases. 
And you may have heard the phrase or the, the term uh, based on Laverne's Law. It involved a woman who brought a lawsuit against a municipal hospital in New York claiming that they failed to diagnose her cancer and she died. Unfortunately for her, she was not timely. And thankfully, last year, the law was changed. So now, patients in failure to diagnose cancer cases have two and a half years from the date of discovering this diagnosis in which to bring a lawsuit. So that is a great result for injured patients in situations involving failure to diagnose. So that's remarkable. What about this one? Let's talk about foreign objects. You go in for surgery and somebody inadvertently leaves a surgical clamp inside of you. Or maybe they leave a surgical sponge inside of you. How much time does this injured patient have to bring a lawsuit? I will tell you it's not two and a half years. And it's not two and a half years from the time of recognizing it. Anybody? Anybody know how much time they have? Before we can answer that question, we have to ask two more questions. Was the thing that was left inside designed to be left inside, or was this something that was never intended to remain inside? And the distinction is critically important. So, in a case involving a patient who winds up having surgery, and now a surgical clamp is left inside, and they find it, let's say, by x-ray, we have to ask the question, was this something that was designed to be left inside? If this is a surgical clamp, the answer is no. So in that instance, the patient has only one year from the date of discovering that in which to bring a lawsuit. Or when they reasonably should have recognized this foreign object. That last trailing part of the sentence is going to be important in a moment. All right, so here's an example. A young couple, a number of years ago, were trying to have a baby. For an entire year they were trying and they were having no success. They decide to go for fertility testing. She winds up being totally fine. The husband, however, not so. Turns out, they asked the, the husband, hey listen, did you ever have surgery when you were younger? He says, yeah, you know what, now that I think about it, I had surgery, I had a portion of my testicle. And the doctor put in something to hold the testicle to the scrotum so this wouldn't happen again. He says, well, that explains it. Because whoever put that in, whoever put in that stitch to hold that in place, cut off the tube that allows the sperm to travel up from the testicle up and out. And because this was closed off at such a young age, you no longer have the ability to have children naturally. So now he turns around and says, I want to sue the doctor who did this procedure. Makes sense, right? Okay. So, how much time does this gentleman have in which to bring a lawsuit against the doctor who treated him when he was a young child? Let's ask the question. Was this stitch something that was designed to be left inside of him? The answer is yes. Which means you don't have the benefit of the date of discovery from that time. You only have two and a half years from the date of the wrongdoing in which to bring a lawsuit. Now, admittedly, this guy was a child at the time, so he was a minor, which means in his case he'd have up until the age he turned into majority. But even then, he was already in his late 20s, which means his time is long gone. So for foreign objects cases, you always have to ask, was this something that was intended to remain inside or not? Makes a big difference. All right, so we talked about the general time frame of how long it takes, uh, how long a patient has. What happens, though, if the wrongdoing happened in a municipal hospital? Jacoby Hospital, Elmhurst Hospital, Queens General Hospital, Harlem Hospital. Anybody know how much time an injured patient has to bring a lawsuit? The answer is 90 days from the date of the wrongdoing to file a notice of claim to put the municipality on notice. And the patient has only one year and 90 days within which to file suit. And by the way, that filing of the notice of claim is a prerequisite, it's a requirement that must be done before. If the patient comes to you now, it's after 90 days, they can still try and ask the court for permission to file a late claim, but doing that is a very long and involved process and it, you're not always successful. It involves getting all the records and having an expert review it and support the argument. And then you have to explain to the court why the patient delayed bringing this within 90 days or filing a notice of claim. 
All right, what happens though in a situation involving an improperly performed delivery resulting in damage to a baby? How much time do the family, do the parents have in which to file suit on behalf of the baby in a private hospital and for a private doctor? Anybody know? In New York, you have 10 years from the date of birth within which to file suit. So now let's jump ahead to what happens if this happened in a municipal hospital. There was an improper delivery. How much time does the family have? They don't have 10 years. They don't have two and a half years. They have to file a notice of claim within 90 days from the date of the wrongdoing. And then they have a year and 90 days in which to file suit. Big, big difference. Huge difference. So, what's the next one I want to talk about? What happens if a family member dies and now the family member wants, the family wants, surviving family wants to sue? How much time does the family have to bring suit for medical malpractice and wrongful death? The answer is two years from the date of death. So you notice we started off with a general rule of two and a half years and now there are many different variations. Okay, so that's two years against a private hospital and private doctor. Now let's turn it around. What happens if this is a municipal hospital? How much time do the surviving family members have to bring suit against the municipality? Shout it out, you know the answer. 90 days to file a notice of claim, one year and 90 days in which to file suit. Very, very different. So make sure when somebody is telling you their story, their tale of woe about what happened to them, you identify exactly where this occurred. And that's part of the questions I'm going to get to shortly about giving you those tips about the four questions you need to ask, almost like in Passover, about the four questions you need to know. All right. Now, ah, anybody hear about something called continuous treatment? Well, continuous treatment is a doctrine that says a patient who continues to treat with their doctor, the time in which they have to bring a lawsuit may be extended until the time that there's no longer a doctor-patient relationship. And why does the court allow this? Because they want the patient to continue getting the treatment from their ongoing doctor, somebody who they're caring for. The doctor presumably knows the patient's condition and is in the best position to try and help them. So they don't want the patient interrupting their care until they realize there's nothing more the doctor can do, at which point the clock starts to run. But here's an interesting situation. Let's say the patient goes to the doctor making certain complaints. And then over the course of time, the patient continues to see the doctor, but for other issues unrelated to the original problem they went there for. Does the patient get the benefit of continuous treatment? You shake your head no. You would be right, okay? And I'll give you a great example. And this involves a dental scenario, dental case. A patient goes in complaining of a problem in the upper left molar. And over the next couple of weeks and months and years, the patient has lots of other dental treatment. Now, three years down the road, the patient has significant problem in the upper left molar. And now needs all sorts of surgery and other problems. And the patient wants to sue the doctor. The problem is, did this patient have continuous treatment? And I will tell you in all honesty, when you talk to somebody and now this issue arises about gaps in treatment or the patient goes for treatment for other things, you are not going to be able to know for certain whether or not there is the benefit of continuous treatment. Why? Because in order to really know the answer of whether the patient can get this benefit of extending the time to bring a case, we have to scour the patient's entire record page by page, visit by visit. We need to know why the patient returned back to the doctor. What was the intention? Why did the patient come back? Was it at the doctor's urging? Or did the patient have a complaint now, an emergency? These make a big difference about whether there's continuous treatment and an ongoing relationship. And the key to answer in these questions about whether or not you can get continuous treatment is did the patient continue to receive treatment from the doctor for the same condition and same complaint that they originally went to them for? If the answer is yes, they'll get continuous treatment. Now their case will be timely. If the answer is no, and you have a gap, a significant gap of treatment, guess what? Then the answer is no. 
but I want to share with you a remarkable case that came out in the first department two years ago. It was called Hill versus New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. And get this, this is fascinating. It blows my mind to think about it. In that case, the key issue was whether a patient who appeared for a planned appointment without receiving treatment represents continuous treatment to satisfy the continuous treatment doctrine. So think about that. The patient goes to the doctor for a visit, for a planned visit. No treatment is actually rendered. It doesn't say why, but no treatment is rendered. And what does the court do? The lower court says, hey, there's no continuous treatment. Case dismissed. Your case is not timely. The appellate division, the first department, turns around and says, wait a second. Hold on. We disagree. And here's why. The appellate court reversed and said, since the patient in the hospital still had an ongoing relationship that was intended to continue forward, continuous treatment is present. And the claim was timely. So that is a remarkable case that allows a patient who might otherwise not be timely, now they are. Why? Because of an ongoing doctor-patient relationship. And now the court says, yes, even though no treatment was rendered, it was the intention of the patient to return and the intention of the doctor to have the patient return for what? Ongoing care and treatment. Very, very interesting, very important point to keep in mind as you're talking to these people to learn whether or not they may have a valid basis for a case. All right. Now, we talked a little bit about children and adults and the time frame. There are variations. Okay. The most important thing to keep in mind is before getting into the details of any case is when did this happen? You always want to know that question. All right. So now. Ah. When do you need a medical expert in a medical malpractice case? Can anyone answer that question? No? Okay, I'm going home. Uh, the answer is, in every single case, we need a medical expert to confirm that the client has a valid basis for a case. It's not like a car accident case where somebody claims they got injured in a car accident and the next day the attorney can go ahead and file suit. We are required to have a medical expert review all of the medical records to confirm what? To confirm liability, causation, and damages. Or, if we put it another way, to confirm that the doctor violated the basic standards of medical care. That's liability. To confirm that his wrongdoing was a cause of the injury. We don't have to show it was the cause. We only have to show it was a cause. That's the link. That's the connection. That's the causation. There must be that bridge between the liability and the injuries in order to connect the two to show we have a valid case. And then we need to be able to show that the client has significant injury. Those are the three things we have to be able to show in a malpractice case. And our expert must be able to confirm each one of those things. If any one of those elements is missing, we can't go forward with the case. So it's critically important to understand those three elements before you can tell the client, hey, listen, you've got a good valid case. So I ask the question, in what circumstances do we actually need a medical expert? And the answer I told you was in every single case. But I should change that. It's not in every single case. It's in every single case but one. And that one scenario involves a case and I'm going to tell you what the English version of the phrase is, and you all know what this Latin phrase is. And the moment I say it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's in a case involving, for example, a patient goes in to have surgery on their right hand. They come out with a third degree burn to their left shoulder. Do we need a medical expert in that scenario? No. Why not? You're perfectly right. You're exactly right. So. The answer is, the thing speaks for itself, which is the English version of saying, there you go, you know it from law school, race ipsa locator, the thing speaks for itself. Does it really? What does that mean in a medical malpractice case? It means that in that scenario where it is so obvious to everybody involved, just telling you in, in a few seconds what happened in this scenario, 
Guy goes in for hand surgery, he shouldn't be coming out with a burn to his left shoulder, right? In that situation where we don't need a medical expert to explain to the jury what happened, we don't need an expert because the thing speaks for itself. Now, here's something interesting. We are only allowed to use this doctrine, this theory, and not bring in an expert under two conditions. The two conditions are that the patient did not cause or contribute to their own injuries. Very interesting. And we find that this really only applies in cases where the patient is under anesthesia having a surgical procedure. Okay? Because that's really the only time we can argue the patient did not cause or contribute to their own injuries. The second thing, the second criteria we have to look at is would this negligence, would this carelessness have occurred but for the negligence of the doctor or the hospital staff? If we can answer that affirmatively, then yes, we can now use res ipsa locator. So, but for the doctor's negligence or the nursing staff negligence in the hospital, this patient would not have had a third degree burn to his shoulder. Okay, that's obvious. But here's something interesting. Even though we don't have to bring in a medical expert, we're not required to, and I can go to a jury in that case without an expert, there are many instances where I will actually bring in a medical expert anyway. Now just ask yourself that question. I don't have to bring in an expert. I don't have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to an expert to come in to talk to the jury. Why would I, under what circumstance, would I still want an expert to come in and talk to the jury? Ask yourself that. The reason why I might want them to come in is because now I want the doctor to go ahead and explain. Tell the jury why it's improper. Tell the jury what the procedure is in the operating room of what's supposed to happen. Explain to the jury. Let them have a better understanding. Now you should know something. If I don't bring in a medical expert, okay, now the jury simply has to rely on the testimony of the patient and anyone else we may have questioned during the course of the lawsuit. And that basically goes out with a little thud. There's no big explosion, there's no big dra drama associated with this finding. Why? Because we make the argument, listen, this shouldn't have happened. And the jury says, yeah, you're right. Okay, let's go on the damages. Well, why not just admit it? Admit you screwed up and let's just have a trial on damages. That's a double-edged sword. Because now the jury doesn't get the benefit of that righteous indignation of how dare this nursing staff allow this to happen. How dare the doctor cause this to happen, carelessly, negligently. So by allowing a doctor to come in and talk to the jury, they now get a better sense of what this really means for the patient and why these procedures were violated in the operating room. So again, that's something to keep in mind when talking to somebody to see whether or not they might have a valid basis for a case. They may have a case, and you may have to bring in an expert, but then again, if this happened in the operating room, they didn't cause or contribute to their own injuries, and now what happened? But for this doctor's negligence, this injury would not have happened. All right, so now let's talk about, ah, we're going to talk about little white lies. A little white lie. Your client during a deposition is asked a very simple question, Mr. Jones, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And he immediately responds, no, of course not. And now the attorney continues on. You think nothing of it because you had no indication, knew nothing, and you forgot to ask the client the question about whether he had ever been convicted of a crime. And your client, the injured patient, in his immediate knee-jerk decision to answer that question, thought, this guy's never going to find out. He's never going to know. This happened so long ago, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to tell him no. Okay, what happens? You can sense the foreshadowing, right? You're now at trial. Now, your client is on the witness stand. He's being cross-examined by the defense. And now the defense attorney pulls out his conviction record and confronts your client with it. And what happens? Your client turns to Jello and he's like, ah, oh, blah, blah, blah. All right, judge, I asked the court to take judicial notice of this plaintiff, this injured patient's conviction record. It doesn't matter what he was convicted for, okay? Could have been something minor. 
If only he said yes. Then you could have dealt with it and argued that that had nothing to do with the claims being made in this case. But for whatever reason, he chose to tell a little white lie. That little white lie can go on to destroy this client's case. And here's how. It's not just that this guy told a little white lie. Remember what I said before? These trials are all about credibility. These cases are all about credibility. So now a jury is evaluating the injured patient's credibility. Are they believable? Is what they are saying, does it make sense? If the answer is yes, now hopefully they'll give us a verdict in our favor. If the answer is no, you're out of luck. Your client gets nothing. So why can this little white lie destroy your client's case? It can destroy your client's case because at the very end of the trial, the defense attorney is going to ask the judge to give the jury a legal instruction that is going to devastate us. And that instruction also has a Latin phrase to it. And the moment I tell you what that Latin phrase is, you're going to immediately realize what I'm talking about. That Latin phrase is called falsus in uno. And what that really means, and what the judge tells the jury, listen, if you find that a witness has testified falsely about one thing, you have the right and ability to disregard part of their testimony. And then he continues, you also have the right to disregard all of this witness's testimony. Telling that little white lie now has empowered the jury to disregard your client's entire line of testimony, which means they could turn around, and if they didn't have a reason to before, now they do. Now they can turn him out of court. Why? They didn't like the fact that he lied about something inconsequential. And I can stand on my head and argue to the jury all day that that had nothing whatsoever to do with the claims of malpractice in this case, of the doctor violating the basic standards of medical care. It doesn't matter. The judge gives the jury that legal instruction. That's all empowering. That's all they need to know. You, the injured patient, you're gone. You get nothing. Goodbye. While I'm on the topic of juries, you should know that when a jury is asked to evaluate a case like this, they have to answer a series of questions. And the answers to those questions formulate their verdict. It's not simply, are you giving a verdict to the plaintiff? And, and now how much? No, it's a bit more involved. The first question that typically is asked is, was the defendant doctor negligent? Was he careless? Did he violate the basic standards of medical care? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, they go on to question number two. Because remember, we have to show liability, causation, and then damages. So if they answer yes, they go to the next question. If they say no, the doctor did not violate the standard of care, he was not negligent, case is over. We go home, nothing. But if we can show that the doctor was careless, and now the question, next question is, was the doctor's negligence a proximate cause of this patient's injuries? And that asks, is there a link between the wrongdoing and the injury? If the answer is yes, now they go on to determine how much money this patient is entitled to receive. If the answer is no, then the doctor has done a good job in one of those defenses saying, hey, I may have done something wrong, but don't blame me because whatever I did didn't cause or contribute to your injuries. And then the jury will have to answer the elements of damages. And there are many different types. There's pain. There's the suffering that the patient endured from the time of the wrongdoing until the time of trial. And then from the time of trial into the foreseeable future for the remainder of this patient's life. We call this non-economic damages. The jury will also be asked to evaluate economic losses, assuming there are economic losses. So let's say your client was no longer able to work and was earning $100,000 a year. Okay, it's easy to calculate. They've been out of work for three years. They lost $300,000. And now they'll have the doctor talk about their inability to work. They're permanently damaged and disabled. And now this client is expected to live for the next 25 years. And the jury can extrapolate. And we can bring in economists to talk about the value of money today and the value of money in 20 years from now. So now the jury has a better understanding of the value of a dollar today and the value of that same dollar 20 years from now. So these are some of the things that should be going through your mind as you begin to ask yourself, what type of injury does this person really have? Is this a case involving 
a minor injury involving bruising, something that's going away after a short period of time? Or is this something a bit more permanent, long-lasting, disabling, that will affect him for the rest of his life? The answer makes a big difference. And the decision that you make will likely lean in favor towards someone who has that permanent injury. A patient who has a temporary or a minimal injury doesn't mean that they don't have a case. It simply means that it may not be likely, will not be viable enough for you or another attorney to take on because an attorney invests a considerable amount of time, energy, and resources to take on these cases. And unless you know at the very beginning that this case has a significant value, it's going to be very challenging to go forward with a case. All right, so that brings me to the four questions. The four questions you need to ask any person you start talking to before you allow them to tell you your story, their story about what happened to them, you need to ask, when did the wrongdoing happen? The second question is, where did the wrongdoing happen? The third question is, what injuries do you have now because of whatever was done wrong? The fourth question is, has any doctor confirmed your belief that something was done wrong? These four questions will tell you in just a matter of moments whether or not this case is likely timely and whether or not this person might have a valid basis for a case. So let's break it down. The first question, when did this happen? Why do I tell you to ask that question? Because you need to know whether or not their case is timely. And what do you know about timeliness? Well, you know this, the general rule. You have two and a half years from the date of the wrongdoing within which to bring a case against a private doctor or private hospital. You also know that if this happened in a municipal facility, municipal hospital, you have only 90 days to file a notice of claim and a year and 90 days in which to file suit. You know this. And then there are other issues, right, about timeliness. But just begin to think in your own mind because it doesn't matter. If their case is not timely, it doesn't matter what happened to them. You can't help them. Nobody can help them. The law is very strict. So why do I tell you to ask the next question? What injuries do you have now? Because you need to determine immediately whether or not this is something worthwhile for you to get involved in or to give out to another attorney in the event you don't want to handle it. So keep that in mind because if the injuries are minimal, your best bet is to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You need to keep looking. If, however, the injuries are significant, disabling, and has affected this person's life and will into the future, now you want to keep talking. So what else do you want to ask them? The fourth question is, has any doctor confirmed your belief that something was done wrong? Now, why do I tell you to ask that question? I should also tell you that in most instances, the patients have not talked to their treating doctors or other doctors, and many times their treating doctors have not criticized the care that doctor number one has given to them. But in some instances, you do have a situation where the doctor or nurse or somebody said something to the patient, whispered in their ear and said, if I were you, I'd get a lawyer. This doctor number one screwed up big time. Or many times, we see this often, a patient will go to doctor number two. Doctor number two wants to be the hero. And he says, oh, that doctor number one, he screwed up big time. I can't believe he did what he did. If you haven't already, you need to go find a lawyer. That's the impetus that starts many of these cases. It's another doctor or healthcare provider who puts a bug in somebody's ear. Says, hey, you should do something about this. This should not have happened. So again, that gives you a clear sense of what to do or whether or not there may be a valid case. All right. So now you're on the soccer field. You're at Starbucks. You're talking to somebody. They just started chatting with you. And now you ask these four questions. You make the decision that, yes, their case is timely. You believe in your mind that, yes, it's a private hospital. Yes, you believe that their injuries are significant. Now you have a choice to make. Are you going to take on their case? Are you going to handle their case from start to finish? Do you have the knowledge and experience and understanding to handle this type of malpractice case as you would the cases that you normally handle? If the answer is yes, that's great. But for many attorneys, the answer is no. I don't have that knowledge and expertise. So what should you do? What you should do is now you've got to make a decision. 
Am I going to refer the patient out to someone else? Do I want to send the patient to an attorney who has the knowledge and expertise and handles these cases on a regular basis? If you decide to refer the patient to someone who now handles these cases regularly, guess what? You have a number of decisions to make. The first and most important decision for you at that moment is you have to tell the client, yes, hey, listen, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to refer you out to this attorney. He handles these cases on a regular basis, okay? Now, you are required to tell the client that there is only one attorney's fee and that if she is successful in her case, there's only one lawyer's fee, even though two attorneys will be sharing the fee, okay? So again, you have to make that decision in your, and the client has to agree to it. And they always do, because they, they're not interested in the one attorney's fee. They just want to make sure there aren't multiple attorney's fees, okay? So now, the next question you have to ask yourself, and this is a policy between you and your firm, is, are you going to accept a referral fee? There are some attorneys who choose, for whatever reason, not to take on a referral fee. That's their firm policy. And they say, we're doing a good service for our client. We want them to know we're helping them by sending them to somebody who can do this. Good luck to you. Keep us in the loop. Terrific. But we need to know that at the beginning. Why? Because if you choose to accept the referral fee, the law says you are now assuming joint responsibility for the client. Actually, the law says, even if you refer the client out, you are assuming joint responsibility. So your name, the referring attorney's name is on that retainer, and it says on there, you assume joint responsibility. Now, in order to generate that referral fee, or to qualify for it, I should say, you are supposed to do some level of legal work to justify that fee. But if you ask 10 different law firms or 10 different attorneys what some level of legal work means, you will get 10 different answers. Some law firms will tell you that you need to get medical records, and that's sufficient. Some will tell you, you need to talk to the client and get more details about what happened. Some will tell you, we want you in on the loop and on correspondence and emails with the client to keep you abreast of what's happening in order to justify a legal fee. There are others still who turn around and say, just send us the client, we'll take care of it, okay? Regardless of what arrangement the firm expects of you, you need to have that understanding in writing before you send the client out. So any agreement you have with any law firm, make sure you get it in writing, okay? Because you don't want to be in a situation where three years down the road the case settles and now if you are expecting an attorney's fee and there's no arrangement, you don't want to be in a situation where the attorney says, what are you talking about? You didn't tell me you wanted an attorney's fee. On the other hand, if you do, just tell us. It's fine, all right? So keep that in mind as you go ahead and are now making the decision about what to do. Another thing you need to know, if you have taken the time to talk to this person who tells you their tale of woe, and you now believe that they do not have a valid basis for a case, okay? You've come to the conclusion either that their case is not timely, or that there's no wrongdoing, or there's no causation, there's no link, between the wrongdoing and the injury, guess what? You will politely tell them, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, I can't help you. But you have to do one more thing. And the one more thing is you must send them a letter declining representation. I call it a rejection letter. And in that rejection letter, you must send it out a certain way. You have to send them a letter by regular mail. And you have to send them a letter by certified mail return receipt requested because you want to make sure that they've gotten that letter saying you are not going to help them and cannot help them. But there's one other thing you have to include in that letter. I want you to reach out to another attorney immediately to get another opinion. Why do we tell you to put that in there? Because you don't want to give the client the impression that you are the be-all and end-all to everything related to law. This person trusts you. You are the lawyer. They don't know that you may handle a different type of law. So they expect that you know every type of law. And you must tell them, please, talk to another attorney. Because what will happen if you don't put that in there? A couple of years down the road, you'll get sued. And why will you get sued? Because the client says, hey, I was talking to another attorney who told me I had a valid basis for a case. And you turned around and told me I didn't. And now it's too late for me to bring a case. And you said, 
wait a second, I told you to go to an attorney. No, you sent me this letter, there's nothing in here. The moment you say, seek out another attorney's opinion, you're off the hook. You're good to go. You know the client got it. Send out regular mail, certified mail, return receipt requested, and you have now protected yourself. So what have you learned during the course of this morning's journey about medical malpractice? Hopefully you've learned something about the time limit in which an injured patient has to bring a lawsuit. Hopefully you've learned about why the judgment call defense is not always appropriate and does not always work. Hopefully you've now learned the four questions about the key questions you need to ask any injured patient the moment they start telling you about a problem that they had with a doctor or a hospital. And as you begin to talk to them and get more details, you need to know one other thing. If you choose to accept a case, you need to know what the fee is. Remember I was telling you about the fee, if you're going to accept the fee? In an accident case, the attorney's fee is a third, right? Okay, in malpractice, it's nowhere near a third. It's a sliding scale. And in medical malpractice cases, the attorney's fee after expenses start only at 30%. And they drop by 5% as we get more and more money for the client. So let's say we get 20% attorney's fee on a particular case. And you have referred the case to us, and now you would like a referral fee. So what is your fee? Traditionally, attorneys will tell you, you will get a sliding scale of a sliding scale, which means if we are able to get 20%, you will get 20% of our 20%. If we can get only 18%, you get 18% of our 18%. Okay? So there's a lot more involved in a malpractice case, many more expenses and resources that are involved, and that's what you will typically find with most law firms where someone brings in a case because now you are referring it out to an attorney who handles these malpractice cases. So again, just keep that in mind. What have you learned in today's discussion? Hopefully you've learned that when somebody tells you their tale of woe, don't turn around and say, tell me what happened, because that will keep you there for over an hour. Instead, ask them, when did this happen? What's the next one? Where did this happen? What injuries did you suffer because of whatever was done wrong? And has any doctor confirmed your belief that something was done wrong? So I hope you found this information helpful. I know you're going to use it during the course of your career, if not immediately. And as you learn this information and as you talk to people, just keep this in the back of your mind. And if you have questions at the end, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm Jerry Ojinski. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>